In this video Kent Hovind gives us his ideas about what happened to marsupials after Noah's flood and I'm going to point out a few problems that I found with his ideas. I'm going to play a long clip of Hovind so as with my last Hovind video I increased the speed so you don't have to spend as much time listening to him. Uh, I think so, and then he goes on to write, do you think, uh, due to the number of varieties, this could have been an example of microevolution? He has a second part to the question, but it, they're unrelated, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, stop here. Okay, yes, thank you for the question. I cover your uh, answer to that on my video series. Uh, it's been eight and a half years since I've seen it myself, but video number six, uh, which covers about the flood. If you look at the planet Earth, you'll notice there's, there are continents and oceans, but the oceans have two very different parts. There's the shallow part around all the continents called the continental shelf, and then there's the deep part of the ocean called the abyss. I believe shortly after Noah's flood, the oceans were smaller because a whole lot of water was trapped in the form of ice at the North and South Pole. If he froze a couple zillion gallons of water and stuck it at the North and South Pole and made ice caps come all the way down to Kansas City, like obviously they did, we see the glacier effects, you can see them all over Minnesota and Central Canada, there are thousands and thousands of cattle lakes, they're called. But you'll notice if he lowered the oceans just 200 feet, let's just pick a number and say 200 to 300 feet, and the oceans average 12,000 feet deep, so 200 feet is not much compared to the 12,000. If he lowered the oceans 200 or 300 feet, froze all that water, stuck it at the North and South Pole in the form of giant ice caps, all of the continents would be connected. You could walk anywhere. I think right after Noah's flood, everything was connected and they could walk from Noah's Ark to Australia. Because the water between Australia and, uh, say, Vietnam and that area is full of islands, Indonesia, etc., was not very deep, 30 feet or so. Generally, real shallow all through there. <laughs> you can find a map that shows the, the depth of the oceans. You'll say, wow, this is all pretty shallow. Between England and France, it's only about 100 and some feet deep of the English Channel. Uh, England would be gigantic if you lowered the oceans just uh, 300 feet. You could walk over to Iceland and Greenland and North America. It's all connected. So I think right after the flood, everything was connected for a couple hundred years. It would take for this ice to slowly melt back, raising the oceans, which is why we have a continental shelf. <laughs> and probably in the days of B-Lake, Genesis 10:25, the Earth was divided either by the rising oceans or by political divisions or by languages, well, not, maybe all three. But that happened in the days of P-Lake. That's another story. Now, I think it's uh, pretty obvious that marsupials, kangaroos, etc., are less aggressive and wouldn't handle a uh, fight very well against, say, a tiger or a lion or a bear. So coming off Noah's Ark, the animals would migrate away from each other until they found a suitable place to have a house and raise their kids. But generation after generation, they would have to continue migrating further away from any ferocious animals that they couldn't, couldn't handle in a fight just for safety of their families. So there would be a migration wave that would take maybe a few hundred years and maybe a few dozen generations, and they would slowly migrate away from the aggressive or aggressive animals. <coughs> I think two things were happening here. The animals are migrating away from the ark over a period of a few hundred years, taking over the entire world, and the oceans are slowly rising, and eventually the kangaroos got as far away as they could get in Australia, and the marsupials did, and ended up being rescued by the rising waters, and they're separated from the ferocious animals, the tigers and uh, stuff of uh, Indonesia. So probably they got trapped on um, Australia. Now, the only marsupial I'm aware of in, in America is the possum. Marsupial simply means an animal with a pouch. And there are the kangaroos, are the primary ones, and I don't know how many flavors there are. 20 or 30, there's one that climbs trees. There's the wallaby, there's the great kangaroo, the red kangaroo, and you got a bunch of flavors of kangaroos over there. I think it would be pretty, uh, pretty obvious that they could have easily had a common ancestor. Uh, and it was a kangaroo. The, the different varieties of kangaroo is evidence of microevolution, no question in my mind. There are several varieties of possums. <laughs> And there's a lot of varieties of dogs. See, microevolution is really a bad word, a bad term. It should just be called variation within the kind. It's the same kind of animal. The different kangaroos are the same kind of animal. <laughs> so it could be there were two or three different varieties that made it from... Like, no, it might have had a couple of different kinds of kangaroos on the ark. I don't know. Maybe all kangaroos can't be traced to one ancestor. Maybe they can all be traced to two. Okay, well, then, no, I have two pair on the ark. I don't know. But anyway, I think they got trapped in Australia by the rising waters, were able to prosper there, take over the whole continent. <laughs> and they diversified and based upon natural selection. The first problem I have with Hovind's idea is that he says that marsupials migrated to Australia to escape from large predators. Apparently Hovind is not aware that there were large carnivorous marsupials living in Australia such as the thylacine and thylacoleo. These predators likely hunted large animals. They may have even hunted Diprotodon the largest marsupial ever discovered which weighed over 2 tons. The thylacine only went extinct in the 1930s but Thylacoleo and Diprotodon went extinct in the late Pleistocene. I'm curious about what Hovin thinks happened to these animals. Did they die in the flood because there was not enough room for them on the ark? Did they survive the flood and migrate to Australia? Or does Hovind think that like the non-avian dinosaurs they are still alive? The second problem I have with Hovind's idea is that the fossil and genetic evidence completely contradict him. 
The fossil evidence shows that during the Paleocene or Late Cretaceous marsupials first migrated to Australia from South America. At this time the climate was much warmer and South America and Australia were connected via Antarctica. This model made a testable prediction. It predicted that we should find fossils of marsupials in Antarctica. That prediction was first confirmed in 1982. There are also transitional fossils connecting different groups of marsupials. Now I know how Kent would respond to this claim. This guy says evolution is a fact and the best evidence for evolution is the fossils. That's silly, okay? There's no fossil record. You cannot look back in the fossil record. You look at fossils in the present. You put your interpretation on them, okay? There is no fossil record. It's stupid to say that that's evidence. If you find a bone in the dirt, all you know is it died. You can't prove it had any kids that lived. You sure can't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? Which is produce something other than their kind. Kent. Animals live in populations so if we find the fossil of a single member of a species we know that there were many others like it. We don't need to show that the particular individual we found reproduced because even if it didn't there must have been others like it that did reproduce. And nobody claims that they produced a different kind of organism. Animals produce other members of their own species. Over long periods of time these species can undergo significant morphological changes due to processes such as mutation and natural selection. These changes are documented in the fossil record of marsupials and show that they did not descend from two of each kind on an arc 4,400 years ago. The fossil Cynodelphys is part of the group Metatheria which includes marsupials and some other closely related animals. Cynodelphys has features intermediate between early mammals and marsupials. Neroborictes from the early Miocene documents the evolution of the marsupial mole. The middle Miocene genus Balbaru is a basal relative of modern kangaroos. The late Oligocene genus Batjacinus is an early relative of the Thylacine. The genus Galati from the late Oligocene and early Miocene is an early relative of Bandicoots. The genera Nemea koala and Leto koala document the evolution of the modern koala. If marsupials were created 6,000 years ago why do these fossils exist can't? Why does the genetic evidence clearly show that all Australian marsupials are related to each other and to South American marsupials? How do you explain all this can't? Once again the answer's magic. Isn't it? <laughs>